both out. 64, 5, 65, 65, 65, you're out down here now. At 65, I bid the bits on my left. At 65, the bits on my left. At 65, one for anybody else now. Are you down and selling at 65 if you finish then? Bowl 65. Right ho, down there's number 33 then from the Mark Mixer. There we are, 60 again, thank you, sir. Gordon and I share an interest in the Sussex Downs and in sheep. Up here on the ancient hill fort of Sisbury, we're in the heart of the old shepherd's landscape. South of us is Worthing, and hidden below, the village of Findon, celebrated for its annual sheep fair. It's a lovely view, Bernard, isn't it? Absolutely superb. Well, it looks grand, and it lifts the spirits too, doesn't it? It does, but it's changed quite drastically, I think, since the days of the old shepherds. I mean, so much of the downland is now ploughed, but in a way, it's quite different. Yes. I think so many people forget that these downland scenes were covered by thousands of sheep. Now, every farm in this area would have had a, a South Down flock. Well, I suppose between Beachy Head and here, a distance of, what, 35, 40 miles, something like that, there were a quarter of a million ewes spread along here. And then think of all the rest of the downland. They could have fed England in those days. But I can see so many changes that have happened since uh, I was a boy when I first came uh, in places like this. Because in those days, there were certainly not as many fences. And uh, as you've been saying, there's so much more ploughed land. And that's going on. And the original down turf is now a very scarce thing. But you can still imagine through all these little folds and pathways, trackways through the downs, how the old shepherds would have brought their flocks at this time of year right down into Findon here for the great fair. The fair held on this village green has changed little apart from transport, but the old shepherds, great characters that they were, become fewer with each passing year. At a fair like this, the shrewd young man would do well to listen. In spite of all the advances in animal husbandry, and perhaps because of it, we're losing just a little of the old craft in farming. A dozen miles away, in the midst of the hills and woods of the Eartham estate, farming methods have certainly changed, and much valuable time is saved because of it. But really knowing and caring about the individual sheep in a flock is as important as ever. Under the knowledgeable eyes of farm manager Richard Brown and shepherd Robert Robb, the flock is sorted and marked. An ability to handle sheep and to judge their growth and development is vital if the farmer is to meet the requirements of the market. 50 Suffolk Cross ewe lambs will be going from here to Findon Fair. And with aerosol sprays and metal gates to help in the sorting, the task is made that much easier. How's it all going, Richard? Oh, hello. Oh, not too badly at the moment, thank you. We've picked out some fat lambs here. Mm. I say fat, they shouldn't be fat nowadays. Housewife doesn't want them fat, does she? <laughs> That's right. But they're, they're finished. They weigh about, about 80 pounds. Mm. What is it you're actually looking for? Because you're handling them all the time, Yes, aren't well, you? when we put the hand over the loin and over the back end, we try and assess the amount of fat that we have on there. We try and get just enough fat cover so they cook well and um, look well when presented on the butcher's slab or the supermarket shelf. So the ones you've marked up, they're the ones heading for the market uh, in a few so, days? Yes. They'll be going next week yeah. to slaughter. Yeah. And the others will be staying in the field here to put on a bit more weight. Mm. Well, these are crosses, aren't they? That's right. The, the black-faced sheep are Suffolk crosses. Mm. The uh, ones with the woolly heads are South Down crosses. But very typical of all downland breeds. They're yes. pretty compact, aren't they? Yes, they're quite chunky and uh, got good fleshing where it, where it counts. Mm. Well, we haven't got any hurdles here, but we've certainly got a lot of tubular yes. stealing, which is doing yes. a, a very good job. Yes, it's a good, it's a good bit stronger than hurdles. Yeah. That part is the crush, and this is the race, and we push the sheep up as tight as we can, so they're easy to handle. What about the old hurdles? Do you use them at all now? No, no, we don't use them at all. Um, I expect you'll see quite a few hurdles at Findon, but um, we use the, the plastic netting that you can see across the field there. Mm. This netting is uh, electrified, on all but the bottom strand and uh, it keeps them back and it's much easier to move and to pitch because the old shepherds used to have to pitch hundreds of hurdles that's right using in their a day. bars and that's driving right them in. yes they yeah. did i wouldn't have liked to have done that but uh, this is much easier 
Pure Southdown sheep are now almost a rare breed when compared with the popularity they once enjoyed. This flock, originally on the Earth estate, was sold, but it moved only a few miles to the farm of David Humphreys, a specialist breeder. The origin of the Southdown is very much a local one. This is the village of Glind, nestling under the South Downs just a few miles inland from Brighton. And just along the road is the celebrated Glyndebourne, famous throughout the world as uh, a great centre of opera. But to the downland farmer and the sheep farmer in particular, it's a place of pilgrimage because here worked and was buried John Alman, the founder of the Southdown breed of sheep that we know today. His achievement is here in stone on his tomb. And those are the words. By him, the breed of Southdown sheep was first improved and through his exertions spread over the whole of the kingdom. And just a few yards away, the farmhouse where he lived. It was in these pastures immediately surrounding the house that the famous Elman flock of Southdowns were formed. He had about 500 of them out in these fields at one time. He was a man with a great eye for agriculture. In those days, 200 years ago, when he first started really working on the South Down, much of this land down here in the valley was flooded. He was largely responsible for gradually getting all of that drained. The sheep themselves, the sort of sheep that he was looking for, he wanted a useful, tight-wooled sheep, something that was going to do well out of doors, and also an animal that carried a useful quantity of meat. Its face, he liked it to have a sort of mousy colour about it, and indeed they are the most attractive of sheep. It certainly attracted the nobility. Even more than that, Farmer George, George III, was on the throne of England at that time, and he had some South Downs, and that encouraged others to buy them too. There was hardly a park of any great country house in England that didn't have its own flock of South Downs. I tend to be old-fashioned. I like a great back end. I think, you know, if, if you lose the back end off of a South Down, you've lost everything a South Down's all about. The judges are casting critical eyes and comments over the fine animals competing in the South Down Ram Show an important element in the fair. It's through rams like these that the quality of South Downs is maintained, as well as improving the crossbreeds. After handling and eyeing from all quarters, the judges reach their conclusions. Everything is immaculate, from the rams to their handlers and the polish on the judges' gaiters. At this standard, there's much satisfaction in competing, and for the winner and runners-up, it's a proud day. With the new meat regime as we've got now, with the emphasis on uh, light lamb and an emphasis on an early finishing lamb, I think you've got a bigger future than you've had for many years. <laughs> There's always an air of excitement and expectancy on the morning of the sale. Sheep even arrive in triple-deck transporters. They look for all the world like day-trippers on trams. And when all the time, it's we who've come to see them. By 10 o'clock, there'll be 8,500 sheep on the village green. Everyone seems involved on Great Fair Day. And contrary to popular belief, unless sheep are handled with understanding, their behavior is by no means predictable. With the excited rush of decanted sheep, the shouts and the vehicles, so the atmosphere of the day continues to build. Villagers join people who've driven many miles to be here, all at the fair because they feel the day to be a very special occasion. Farmers once arrived here in gigs, and there were not only sheep for sale, but cattle, horses with manes and tails plaited with straw, and goats and donkeys too, while gypsy women made sweets that were sold on the stores. <laughs> It's not essential that today's farmers attend fairs like these, but they hold a special place in country life. And it's so much nicer to conduct business over a hurdle rather than over the phone. 
Well, you got them in early on this morning, Richard. Yes, well, quite good time. They should be selling uh, from 10 o'clock. They start with the store lamps first. Well, they're they looking good. They don't look good. too mucky, no. no they look very, well. Very good. Come along, come along exceedingly well. I noticed, even though they hadn't been in here very long, there were very soon a couple of chaps in here feeling them over very carefully. Yes, well, it's nice to see people interested. Yeah. You know. So you've got a feeling that they might uh, might do well today? I think so. The prices on Thursday down at Wilton in Salisbury were mm. quite well up. So, uh, you know, we're looking yes. for at least 35, 36 pound a head, I think. See what we get, shall we? Gordon has spotted Robert Boodle, who's Joe Henson's shepherd. In the country, it's surprising how often you bump into people you know. Hello, Robert. Nice Hello, to Gordon. see you. Gosh, you've made Findon Fair after well, all. It took me three years, but I got here at last, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got some sheep to sell? Uh, no, I'm looking for a Southdown ram. Are we've, you? We've got a small flock of Southdowns at the Cotswold Farm Park, and uh, every now and again you have to change the blood. And, uh, of course, this is the centre of the Southdowns. They've lost popularity, but now I think the breeders are conscious of that, and they're, they're improving the size and they're changing the shape of the South Down into a slightly larger sheep. It's got a beautiful back end. Look how broad and wide they are. And uh, they really produce a very nice early maturing lamb, which, well, it's the epitome of sheep breeding. With the ringing of the bell, the real business of the fair gets underway. The auctioneer's catalogue is the guidebook for the day. A tool for the buyer, souvenir for the visitor. But you'd have to be up early to pull the wool over a shepherd's eyes. 100 to start, babe. 100 to start. 80. 80 I bid over there at 80 pounds I have. At 80 pounds, at 80 pounds, at 80 pounds I bid. At 80 pounds I bid. 81, 82, 83, 84. The South Downs are now in the lap of the market and its forces, where value is no longer speculation, but what someone is prepared to pay on the day. In company like this, the auctioneer will already know most of his audience, and when bidding, to him, a nod is as good as a wink. At 89.90, at 90 pounds I bid. 91, 91, 92, 92, 93, at 93, at 93, it's still against you. At 93 pounds... 94, do you say, sir, at 93. No, four for anybody else now. All silent, are you, at 93? 93. This ram has failed to reach reserve, but it's a specialist market, and few have come here to buy Southdowns. May be sold privately later. 570 lots are being offered in three rings by four auctioneers. Yeah, nice level consignment, this lot. <coughs> lot 340 is a Dorset Down shearling ram. The Dorsets are in demand. Prices seem to be good, and those months of organization on the part of the auctioneers, coupled with the work of the shepherds, look like paying dividends. At 165 pounds, is a 70 somewhere? <coughs> at 165 pounds, you'll finish then at 165. Until the mid-twenties, the sheep came to the fair on their own four feet, some by road, others coming down off the hills like drifting clouds in the dawn. They came in their thousands, shepherds, dogs and drovers, with all trackways seeming to lead to Findon. The first lorries began to appear here in the late twenties, and sheep also began to be transported by rail. The flocks were being forced off the roads as the traffic increased, the klaxon horn drove the sound of the sheep bell from the country lane. And on the downs themselves, the old routes were becoming neglected, until today, they're totally deserted. Some of the old trackways remain on the steeper slopes, but ploughing has altered so much of the old downland. And gone with the flocks, the equipment that made life tolerable on these hills. Just imagine the sort of weather those old shepherds would have had to contend with on this open downland. Yes, well, it is open, and it would really blow into you so hard you could get soaked in no time at all. Well, you think of the heavy rains. They didn't have the waterproofs that we know of today. What they wanted was a nice old thick bush behind them. That's it. And a big important part of their waterproof was an old umbrella, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it certainly would, Gordon. And they were using these, what, even a generation ago. 
I mean, an inseparable part of their equipment. They'd have slung this on their back, carried it like a, a rifle, really. And then when you did get those days when the hard weather really did pour in and was gusting into you, they would simply look around for some bushes like this, get the brolly up, and they would back away, probably wearing their greatcoat, and push right back into it, leaning right back, falling back onto the hedgerow, almost using it like a couch, and just leaving enough room so that they could peer out and see the flocks down below them and keeping very dry in the process. Gordon and I share an interest in the lives of the old shepherds, and he's taking me to see his latest discovery, an old shepherd's hut, one of the few that's been rescued and restored before it's too late. That's a lovely hut. I suppose some people would think it was a bit, uh, bit tatty looking. It's obviously been fixed here, but it's still got the original wheels on it. Is it as good inside as it is out? Even better. Let's go and have a look. Well, I have to snug home. This would have made for a shepherd for a few months, uh, Gordon. Marvellous. Bearing in mind, he had the shepherd's stove, which really would have made it snug. When that was throbbing away, giving out that terrific heat, it got very hot in here, I think. I think it would have done. Yes, <laughs> yes. Look at those bells. And just to think that once all of these downs through here would have been ringing to that sound. And the shepherd's lantern, quite a special thing to have. Yeah. Lovely. The badge of office, of course, the shepherd's crook. Yeah, just like a bishop's crozier, isn't it? Isn't that a beauty? Marvellous, yeah. Well looked after, too. Indeed it is. But uh, just look at this panelling here. It's absolutely as good as it was when it was put in. Certainly, Certainly. well constructed. It, well, they were well constructed. And the point about that, Bernard, I was able to find some actual plans of shepherds' huts. If we go outside, we could see them in the sun. Yeah. They're so nice. Now, this is an actual plan, Bernard, of a shepherd's hut, drawn by the firm that actually built this one. That's tremendous. You did well to find this. I know. Perfectly simple. But they must have turned these out in enormous numbers at one time. Oh, I think they did. But even to the extent I those. found here, yes, look at this. Old catalogues. Little catalogues, yeah. 1928. Yeah. And as you can see, the construction of that mm. is very similar to this one. Oh, and we got the price lists as well. Look at that. Was it 46 quid? One the size that we've got here, 46 pounds. Isn't that astonishing? And the design is so much the same, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But even perhaps more interest in April 1960 and the design is exactly the same. They're still pouring them out then. And the price? Well, that's 153, so it's, uh, it's gone up a bit with inflation. Just a little bit. Finds like this bring the traditional shepherd's world to life. We've both collected shepherd's equipment for years, so I went off to Gordon's house to look at some of his collection of everyday things that were once part and parcel of their life. I think that's my favourite. Yes, that's a beauty. It's a Sussex crook. Mm. Absolutely classic form, isn't it? A beauty. Mm. I found it in an old cottage at Findon, in the cellar, so I know the history. I know that old shepherds lived in this cottage and that's where this crook came from. Mm, lovely. The interesting part about it, it's got such a short barrel. And I'll show you another crook here. Another Sussex crook. Can you see the length of that barrel? That's how it ought to be. That's right. Now, the reason why this one is so short is because the sticks were always breaking, and they would break off inside that iron barrel. And the way the old shepherds used to get the sticks out is to build a little fire and put the crook in the fire. And But over years of doing that, the barrel itself got rather brittle and thin. And in this case, they cut it off short because they wanted to keep it, because it was their favourite crook. Yes, that's it. Oh, it must have been much favoured for him to go to all that trouble. He might just as well have gone and bought a new one. Well, but it obviously was something very special to him indeed. I think Lovely so. thing, and a, and a very good light hook too. It is. The, the beauty of about a Sussex crook is the great quality of the workmanship. Well, I've got four here from my corner of Sussex, all made within a 10-mile radius. And yet, as you can see, they are astonishingly different in reality. This one in particular, I think, is, um, is quite an old one. I think it is. It's got such an open sort of mouth there, isn't it? Yes. Of course, the other thing they love was the bells. Shepherds and sheep's bells and shepherds' crooks. Not only did they 
have the bell because they made all the tackle to go with it. The old bits of leather here from a harness, mm. the yokes carved out of the hedge. But again, I've got a special thing here. Have you seen a bone locker? Yes, I have, but not many. These, to me, always seem like little amulets of some past way of life. And in fact, that's just what the shepherd's life was. But these were the fasteners, weren't they, that kept these... That's right. ...on that yoke. Some of the shepherds that were really proud of their ring of bells had bone lockers as opposed to wooden ones. Mm. can't take my eyes off this uh, this old lamp, you know, Gordon. Lovely thing, isn't it? Well, I was lucky to find that one, Bernard. Again, thinking of the old shepherds, it was a very important piece of his functional equipment. He would be lambing, say, in December, January, our early part of the year, and the lambing fold would be covered in straw, and there he'd be going around with this, this old lantern, this horn lantern, and he would perhaps put it down to attend to a ewe. We well, imagine if the ewe threw back its leg and kicked this over. If that had been glass, it would shatter and be very, very dangerous. So you can see why these old lanterns were used, you know, quite late, up until, say, the 1920s. Mm, perfect for the job. I've got something over here for you. I call that a yoke, but I think you've got a different name, haven't you? <laughs> well, down in Sussex, the old shepherds would have called them bilbos, and they tend to call them sheep bows in Sussex today. And, of course, this pointed end here, they were used for simply driving into the earth, and then you've got this catapult shape and the holes across where you would slide a bar through to hold a sheep's head in there so that it could be worked on either for some veterinary reason or simply for smartening it up for a, a show. But it's interesting how these curious names, you know, come into being, because Bilbo in Sussex is believed to have come from Bilbao, where steel was made in the 16th and 17th centuries to make objects rather like this to hold prisoners on board the Spanish men of war. And uh, it looks as though somebody brought this design into the county of Sussex. They all started up from there and they called them Bilbo's. The daily work of a shepherd involves many skills. Alan Lungley is one of the few still to live in a hut during the lambing season. But even he's been told by his employer to update his ways. This will be the last winter before Alan's hut becomes a museum piece. Discovering this pub at Amberley was a lucky find. It contains one of the best collections of sheep bells I've seen. The landlord is John Sidebottom. And um, I thought I'd have to start some collecting something for the pub. Uh, and as I've been a sheep farmer in Patagonia, before the war, I thought, well, what better than a bell? And there was a local shepherd, um, Frank, Frank Oliver, who um, I knew had a collection which he no longer used, and he produced all these others. And subsequently, of course, I then discovered that there were others than cluckers, there are canisters, and uh, <laughs> over there, you'll be able to look at them. They're beautiful. They are lovely, yes. They're on the large size. I've never seen uh, bells. They're not really bells at all. Well, but they must have made very good music up on those hills, I think. And I also got a, a, a Pikeham crook that uh, Frank here gave me when I first came here. Really? So if you want to know anything about it, you better ask Frank, because yeah, Frank that's, that's his well, set. I'm very pleased to meet pleased you. Pleased to see you. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Always good to meet a Sam like Down Shepherd. Crook? Oh, I'd love to see the crook, yeah. It's a very old one, and it's 250 years old. 250? Mm. If I had as many pounds of what that bring around sheep legs, I wouldn't do anything now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you wouldn't. All your family were shepherds, were they? All shepherds, five shepherds. Uh, four brothers, my father, and the great grandfathers, I don't remember them. <laughs> These bells must bring back a lot of memories for you. They do, yes. I, I, I always should keep some, I think, for keepsake, you know. Mm. We used to have 60 one time and put them on the flock. Well, about September, you know. Mm. Used to have them. For foggy weather more than anything. Really? So you knew where the sheep was when they was all spread it out, you know, to tell me each bear which where they was. Sam must have carried quite a That's away. That's right. Mm. Yeah. What about the actual making of them? I mean, those yokes, they're always so nice. I mean, often they're in yew wood, aren't they? Used to cut them out of yew trees, and when I was on the downs, I used to sit down and make the yokes and cut the pegs out of bones, you know, rib bones, and that's how we used to fit them up. 
Well, they're little works of art, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. Must have been great fun going to the fairs like Finden. It was, yeah. Quite interesting. You see all folks that you perhaps hadn't seen for this many years, you know. You drop in and see them. And mm -hmm. All the dogs and the sheep drove on the road, you know, flocks after flock. And, mm -hmm. Well, it was eight miles from Weapon to Finden, I think, and eight miles back. If you went to bring some sheep back, which was unsold, you know, you had that double distance for the... And then walk. you had to walk home. Walk home, yeah, 16 miles. Really? Mm. Yeah. And you learnt all the craft of shepherding, what, from your father? Yeah, oh, yes. I just started at eight years old, I suppose. Did you? Mm. Up on the downs, minding the sheep. Yeah. What sort mm. of money did you get paid then? Well, I got three and six. Three and six a week? Three and six a week, yeah, six months a day. Mm. The auction is now well advanced into the afternoon, and many farmers will already be pleased with the day. For others, the bidding is still to begin. Up to the end of the last century, all the deals made at Finden Fair were by private treaty, each shepherd being entrusted with selling his flock well. And today, the role of the auctioneer is vital to the success of the day. As he chants the difference between profit and loss, he's like a commercial priest, intoning the ancient litany of pounds and pence. At two, at two, at two, and who's three now? At six two, at six three, at three, at three on the far side, at six three, at six three, at six three, take half your life, at six three, at six three, at six three, say half anywhere, are you finished then? Anyone on 63, on the far side, Stanford, Though the shepherd's life and the breeds of sheep may have changed, the excitement of buying and selling remains the same. Well, Robert, did you manage to buy anything? Yes, that was quite successful. I bought a pen of five ewes earlier on, and I've just bought a ram. So you've done very well. Yes, and uh, I've made point of buying them from different breeders so that the, the blood is, bloodlines are different, and then we can take them back and, and use them in our little flock at the, at the farm park. We've sold uh, three out of the four rams that we brought. Well, that's very uh, good. Sold them quite well. Mm -hmm. And I think I sold the ewe lambs at a good price. Quite happy about that. Well, you said you were looking for something of, like, 35, I think, well, we and got, they fetched more. We got 36.80, yes, which is a good price. I hope they're pleased with them. For the auctioneers, it's been a long and tiring day. Hard on the voice, demanding in concentration. But they have just cause for satisfaction. A Southdown ram made 200 pounds, and for the first time in the history of the fair, over 100 pounds a head was paid for use. Yet in spite of good prices, such fairs are becoming rare. The problem with a fair of, of this type, um, which is pitched specifically for one day, is the cost of, um, the cost of erection, um, the labour for putting this up. And labour becomes more and more expensive relative to other things all the time. Mm. and um, there may come a day when, when it will become too expensive, mm. but I sincerely hope it won't. Finden Great Fair is rooted in the 13th century and has borne fruit for a single day in September ever since. A market and a meeting place, far too good to lose. <laughs>